Good afternoon, and welcome to Boosting Audience on Linear and Digital. TV News Check's editor, Michael Depp, will be moderating today's discussion. So without further ado, take it away, Michael. Hello, I am indeed Michael Depp, editor of TV News Check, and this is Boosting Audience on Linear and Digital, a TV News Check Working Lunch webinar. I am very pleased to be with you here today and with these fine panelists who I will introduce in just a moment. This conversation is all about finding novel approaches to find new and larger audiences, and each of these panelists have been doing interesting work to that effect. We're going to take a closer look at what they're doing in just a moment. For those of you who have questions during the webinar, you can submit them at any point. Please use the Q&A button and not the chat, because I'll look for them there, and I'll try to get to as many audience questions as possible. Our panelists today are Manny Fantas, Senior Director of Digital News and Publishing at Sinclair Broadcast Group. Hello, Manny. Ken Haddad, Special Projects Manager at Graham Media's WDIV in Detroit. Hi, hello, Ken. April Paloli, Head of Product and Innovation at Social News Desk. Hi, April. Jennifer Rigby, News Director at Tegna's WXIA in Atlanta. Hello, Jennifer. Joni Vasiliadis, VP of Digital Content at Tegna. Hi, Joni. And Tim Wolf, VP of TV and Digital Publishing Innovation at Futuri. Welcome to all of you. Jennifer, I would like to start with you and the very novel approaches to uh, citizen journalism that you're doing at WXIA. You've been taking some very charged issues and putting viewers behind the wheel of the reporting process. Um, let's just look briefly at a clip of one of those here. Guess what? I'm not the one asking the questions. You are. Who get to meet the experts? The number one question is, how would you define critical race theory to just like a layman? Would it make white people feel guilty and black people to feel this is very informative. So maybe come over there and hug you. Huh? <laughs> I just was not familiar with that part of history. It's okay to disagree. It's not okay is that refuse to communicate civilly with each other. I wish everyone could just be a part of this. After everything you've learned, have you had to change your part? My decision would be. Great. So Jennifer. Can you explain what you did with these efforts and why? Yeah, that's the, that's a project called Drawing Conclusions, and we've done uh, we have done two episodes, and we're about ready to do a, two, a third one. The the why is obviously I think all of our why great journalism, right? Really important journalism with trust, with transparency, building trust with our audience. So we have taken some charged issues. And um, we've done it in a way that takes the person who's skeptical or has a lot of questions and we put them at the forefront and had them ask the questions. And Drawing Conclusion was born actually out of a, um, a partnership we started with Solutions Journalism Network about three years ago. And there was a grant project. And uh, as part of the grant project, our reporter, Andy Ferrati, who's part of our um, great investigative team, was really curious about how about this vaccine hesitancy in 2019. And there's a case in Samoa where there was a measles outbreak due to disinformation. And it was sort of easy to prove because of the fact that it was on an island. And so we were um, pitching a project to take someone who was vaccine hesitant and truly take them to Samoa and to see what had happened with this measles outbreak. That was in the first of 2020. We were gonna go in June of 2020. So obviously that didn't happen. When the pandemic hit, we decided to re retrofit the idea, obviously with vaccine hesitancy. And um, with our market, Atlanta, and our very diverse uh, newsroom, our staff was already coming out saying, hey, there's an issue with our black audience, with the black community, with vaccine hesitancy, their skepticism. They were hearing it obviously within their own circles. We knew it was a, we knew it was going to be an issue. And um, it, it's it's you know rooted, obviously, the skepticism and the mistrust is rooted in the past, in the history, Tuskegee, Henrietta Lacks. Um, it, it all makes sense, it's all understandable. So this was early in the vaccine development. So we put out a call, Andy put out the call. One of our reporters found Joy, you saw her. Um, asking the questions. And uh, she is the one that took us on the first journey. We lined her up with experts, 
And she was able to ask all of the questions she had with all of these experts. So what's really been remarkable about the project is we found these people willing to do it, obviously. It's several interviews, it's a lot of time. And then we've had remarkable experts. Uh, the critical race theory couple, uh, Andy actually followed up with them. They were um, uh, at a school board meeting and they were uh, against the DEI officer. They were voicing their concerns about a DEI officer being uh, brought into the school. So that's, that's how we found that couple. And they went through the process, which was remarkable. Our next one, which is going to air at the end of this month, I think is the most remarkable one yet. We found someone who uh, believes that the 2020 election was stolen and has been very outspoken on uh, social media against our Secretary of State and another one of our election officers. And so he agreed and our Secretary of State, Gabriel Sterling, who some of you might know his name from all the election um, controversy, agreed to meet with him. And so we have taken him through the process of was the 2020 election results, are they legitimate? So that one's gonna air at the end of, that's gonna air at the uh, first of March is when it's going to, that's when that one's gonna air. So all of this, I think for us came from this partnership with Solutions Journalism, this need to, get into some really meaningful journalism to some strong journalism in a different way, right? In a way that stood out, in a way that felt the trust, in a way that was transparent. And I think, um, especially with vaccine, it's one thing to tell people you should get the vaccine, but when you take someone who really was concerned about it and skeptical, skeptical and allow them to ask the questions and allow them to say, I reached this conclusion because I think it just has a much greater impact. Well, I'm, this experiment can be a tough needle to thread, but it's also a, a very ingenious way to foster a sense of transparency with viewers and to engender trust with them. So how did viewers react and how did you capitalize on this to build audience to your, your broadcasts and your digital platforms? Well, it, people were, I mean, obviously the, the reaction has been extremely positive, right? I mean, across, uh, uh, across all, all, from both critical race and the vaccine. And in fact, Joy, who did the vaccine, uh, with us, she said that she had so many people thank her for going through it. And the fact that she went through it, they felt they found a level of comfort, right? And it helped them make their decision. And she was able, she was able to share her experiences in her own community. Um, so I think what's important about this, the way that we did this in this content, it's really rich, deep content. And you're right, it's very tough, deep issues that come up in our newscasts practically every day. So we have this great content. It, we are allowed, we're able to customize our storytelling across all platforms. So it's, you know, from online episodes on our website to um, all of them together on YouTube to customize shorter pieces for the, for the shows, every show, you know, the morning show would get a 45 second version. The five might get a two minute version to a special half hours. We've turned all of these into special half hours, which we've aired multiple times after uh, we have two channels as well, so we've we've aired them on both channels. We've aired them in different time slots, and they do you know really well in some time slots, not as well in others. But what we found is we we're reaching a new audience, and it, Critical Race has been interesting. That one has done really well on YouTube and has done really well, especially with men, which is which is broadening our audience, broadening and changing our linear audience, the audience we typically target. So we find that we're reaching a whole new audience, and then. It's content that is 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 good today as it was six months ago when we produced it. For example, there's a critical race bill going through the legislature right now. So we led our six o'clock newscast the other night with a story about the critical race legislation, and then we brought Andy in to come back with the 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 um, uh, work we've done on critical race and the couple we spoke to, and that added so much depth and per perspective to the top of our six o'clock newscast. So it's really rich content that goes across all platforms, and it has a long life, right? As there's a yeah. long tail to it. Sounds like you a very long keep tail. Keep accessing it, and it brings that depth into your show on a day when you know you're you're running around trying to get newscast on the air. But I already have this amazing piece of content and perspective that is still as, as meaningful today as it was the day that we, even the vaccine one is meaningful today. It's just as meaningful today as it was a year ago. Have these projects been, become an important part of the station's overall branding campaign? Well, it, yeah, our, our brand, by the way, is where Atlanta speaks. So I think this, this is, the, is the very definition of our brand, right? You have a voice. 
we listen. In this case, we're truly giving you the voice. We're bringing you, we're giving you access to the experts we normally talk to, but now we're going to give you access to these experts so you can ask your questions and you can be the one that brings those tough questions. Mm -hmm. uh, it, for us, it looks it looks to expand the conversation. So it's just it's not just a black and white us versus them situation, right? It's not that we're all going to take our sides and then just stand stiff and not and not listen to each other. It's a conversation. I think it seeks understanding where Atlanta speaks. We're seeking understanding, right? We're looking for solutions to some of these. What are some of the things people are doing to solve some of these big problems? That's all part of our brand. That's that's part of what we believe where Atlanta speaks is and how we are communicating our brand to our audience. Ken. You are a master of the newsletter at WDIV in Detroit, where you put out over 30 of them in regular rotation. Now, there's nothing new about a newsletter, but you've been able to use them to forge a very personal, dedicated viewership that you've been able to push down a funnel towards a membership program that the station has. Can you explain how that overall process works? Yeah, so, you know, we've invested so much time and energy into newsletters. Um, I'm probably like the US ambassador to, to newsletters at this point, but it's for, it's for good reason. In 2019, we had six newsletters. In 2020, we got up to 25 newsletters. Um, the start of 2021, we launched 10 new newsletters, bringing us to 36, and 32 of those newsletters were curated newsletters, which means that they're actually being written by people. They are not automated headlines or an autom they're not on a schedule. They're being sent out by people you know, at certain times or periodically, depending on the topic. So what we did is we looked at a lot of the topics that we know our audience has existing interest in. And then we looked for ways that we can expand on that coverage and not just additional content, but with some voice, with some personality. Can mm -hmm. we add more depth to this topic? And that's, what, that's how we came up with all of these newsletters. They range from sports to fact-checking to all of our major TV franchises. Um, to, you know, our morning report, which is our daily newsletter that goes out every single morning. Um, we have a climate change newsletter. We have um, a parenting newsletter. All of these things came from existing interests that we knew our audience uh, cared about. And How? go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say the, the biggest part of this was our mission to continue growing our loyal fan base. And what we found was the more newsletters that we launched, the better relationships we were building with readers and the better relationships that we build, the better feedback that we get, um, the better UGC that we get. Um, and overall, just the, the better, um, you know, overall traffic that we get from loyal users on a daily basis, the baseline of that has increased year after year. Mm -hmm. And so I was going to ask how, how you are measuring success, what, in what quantifiable ways and what kind of success are you seeing? Yeah. So, you know, I'll say in, in last year, we sent 70 million individual emails. Um, just that, just that sheer volume of, of engagement that we're, sh even if people aren't opening up, hopefully they're seeing it or, you know, just getting in front of, of eyeballs is such a huge win for any media outlet at this point, because it's just so competitive out there, especially email. You're, people are getting emails from all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, we don't measure emails on a you know one benchmark, we have goals for specific emails. If an email is is a you know the goal is to drive traffic, then we're looking at clicks. If if we're if the goal is to inform, we're looking at opens, uh, you know things like that. But the major measure of success for us is are we getting engagement back from our users? And most of our newsletters uh, have some sort of way that users can engage with us in a two way conversation, and that's really been the key for us because if you're just talking in a one-way conversation, just like you would in real life, the response is not gonna be great because the people don't think you're listening to them um, and you're gonna get low quality feedback from, from readers. But mm -hmm. as we open that two-way conversation and they realize there's actually someone behind this newsletter and they're reading what we're sending them and they're responding, um, the quality of that response just continues to increase. And it's so much better than it was when we just used to post something on Facebook and ask for, you know, response on something. The response that we get through newsletters because we're building that relationship over time is so much stronger than it was when we were just doing it on social media. Yeah, and I just want to plug, we've done a how-to video on how to make a, how to develop a great newsletter strategy with Ken Haddad, which is a sort of step-by-step -step on, on what he does. 
Um, April, Social News Desk has a tool for driving newsletter signups, and you've worked with WDIV to roll that out. Can you explain how that works? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what's great about the tool, um, we call it Dynamic News Ads, or DNA for short. It's our pro proprietary technology, and what it does is it takes the great content that these stations are producing, and it actually looks at signals from social and website and your website to see what people are engaging with. And it dynamically creates ads in real time based on that content. And so we call it a content to capture. Basically, we, dra we drag them in with that engagement with that story, that really, really great content we've been talking about today. And then to engage and read that story, they provide their, um, their email to sign up for the newsletter. And so um, one of the great ways we've done that with WDIV is they have their great newsletter around con the consumer advocate, Help Me Hank. Um, and so we've been able to take the content that is really resonating with the audiences from that and drive people to understand, hey, you can get more of this content, sign up for our newsletter. And so we, we've actually seen with them um, when, when they were, when WDIV was doing it by themselves, we've been able to drive down costs by a third using this technology to really get people to engage with it. Mm -hmm. And Ken, a quick question from the audience. Do you have a staff dedicated to newsletter production? No, actually. So one of the keys to sustaining 36 newsletters in a newsroom is just building it into our workflow. And that took a long time to be clear, but you know, now newsletters are at the forefront of what we're doing on any story. And they used to just be a side project, which is why, which is why they never really grew because we never got to them. You never actually get to your side project as everyone knows. Mm -hmm. So when you build it into your actual workflow and you're dedicating time at the top of your content strategy and not at the bottom of your content strategy, um, over time, you really build that consistency and that and that flow. It, the news, the newsletter content just starts flowing, and that's what we that's what we found. And it's also a team effort. You know, the digital team writes, our reporters write. Everyone in the newsroom is engaged in the newsletters. It's not just one or two people, and that's also key. You really have to, you know, get buy-in from from everyone, including on-air talent. Mm -hmm. And I think it needs to be underscored that the personal element to these newsletters, that you are a presence in it, that you have direct questions that you pose. And it's simple. It's not very technologically complex. Often it's just a question you ask the audience, but it's the kind of question that solicits a very specific answer and thus meaningful engagement follows that. So I think that's a key part of its success. Um, well, Tim, Futuri uses AI as a driver for newsrooms to understand their entire audience in real time via data that's collected on social and in turn uses that to help grow audience. Can you explain how that works? Sure. So at Futuri, we focus our AI on helping stations understand their local audience. On the content side, we have Topic Pulse Content Advantage, which takes in data from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and more than 100,000 publishers. There's a screenshot of what it looks like there. Um, with all that data, we then format it in useful and actionable ways, filtering it out across categories, everything from national and political to military and lifestyle and pets for Ken's All for Pets newsletter. I think it's a great fit there. And also down to local markets and what they're engaging with. And with all that data coming in from all those places, the only way to harness that and make it useful is through artificial intelligence. Now, while we've been using AI to measure local audience engagement for over a decade, uh, our approach was really reinforced by some recent research we did. Uh, we asked hundreds of broadcast leaders uh, a range of questions about themselves and their newsrooms. Many of you may have taken part or seen that survey. One question we asked was about where their newsrooms are getting story ideas today. And the number one answer across the board was social media. So we've really focused on social, not just a tool to get our stuff out, but to really understand our audience, to figure out what is our audience engaging with what's really driving their interest in this moment as now they're watching social on their phones while they're watching on TV or watching TV on their phones while social's chiming in, really getting to understand what do they care about in a way we never could have before without this kind of data. Mm -hmm. and, and this is designed in large part to get journalists out of their newsroom bubble and their own social bubble to find audiences that they may be underserving, right? Absolutely. You know, one of the things I did in, in each of the newsrooms where I worked, I was in Dayton and Louisville and St. Louis, was go through our editorial team and say, where does everybody live? And just kind of plot that out on a map. And I think you'll find in most newsrooms to be true, most of your editorial staff lives in three or four communities that all kind of look like each other. Uh, we all tend to have the same education, similar interests. And so before social media was a problem where 
those stories that affected those communities where we lived or those interests tended to naturally get more attention from us. That's human. That's what we did. Social media has made that even a, a bigger thing as it's become the number one news source because what's in my social media feed is probably different than what is in somebody else's social media feed. And so we begin to unconsciously have that sort of bias towards what we happen to see and what we happen to engage in in the newsroom. So with data, we can really combat that sort of newsroom bubble. We can look at the numbers and say, this is what everybody in our community cares about and really refocus how we channel that information that's coming in into which stories are really most important to our communities. And even before social and newsrooms, I was able to take efforts like that and grow ratings significantly by forcing us to sort of track who we were talking to and where and what stories and communities we were covering. Now with that and, and the way we can harness this from social and publications, it really helps us be able to do that in real time and get beyond our gut instincts and really into what does our community care about most. And when we do that, then we really build loyal viewership and long time sustainable ratings growth. Well, I know I've talked to a lot of groups that are making a concerted effort to try to get out of their usual zones of coverage, literally the zip codes that they go back to again and again to try to, to find audiences where they weren't looking before. Um, there's actually a question, uh, Tim, on uh, what are the numbers in your, your presentation, for instance, 41 to 49 on the Atlanta fire story? What, is, what do those mean? Oh, so that, and I'm uh, happy to showcase this to anybody, but that's live demo information. So that's among all social users, where is this over-indexing? Is it over-indexing with men or women uh, and what age, what age range? And you see this one, this particular slide is from a few days ago, that is just the Atlanta market. The story is from all 100,000 publishers that are, that the AI says, these likely matter to people in the Atlanta area. And then it just kind of gives us an indication of, who's engaging with that story at a higher level than others. So that top story, men and women 26 to 34 were the ones who was index over indexing with the most. And if you went down to number six there, and you'd see talking about it's more men and number eight, the Miranda Lambert story and the predators, which is a little bit outside of Atlanta, um, you know, 26 to 34. So that kind of data in real time demographics does help newsrooms who are focused on which demographic are we going to win or attack today? Which I know particularly, you know, we tended to, I tended to be at stations that were market leaders and we really tried to win the whole market. But at times when you're the number two or number three and you're trying to gain audience in certain ways, you might attack a certain demographic and try to grow that way. So we provide all that information just to help the newsroom make better decisions that meet their brand and meet their local community's needs. Okay, and stepping backwards for just a second, April, we had a question that disappeared, but it was about, the name of the product that you were referring to. What is that, please? Yeah, it's called Dynamic News Ads. Okay, great, great. And also we have another question for Ken, just to go backwards there on, uh, are you concerned that uh, having too many newsletters have a has a diminishing returns effect? Yeah, I get that question a lot, actually. Um, no, because all of those newsletters have specific audiences. So it's not like one user is getting 36 newsletters. People sign, can sign up for you know the topics that they're interested in. Um, and those, those communities, those lists of people kind of work within themselves. They don't, they don't diminish each other. They work in their own little bubbles. Manny, like many station groups, Sinclair has dipped a toe into documentary production. This has become a, a more ambitious endeavor of late though. And I'd like to ask you about Como in Seattle and the documentary Seattle is Dying, which covered the homelessness crisis there. Let's first look at a brief clip. is about a seething, simmering anger that is now boiling over into outrage. It is about people who have felt compassion, yes, but who no longer feel safe, no longer feel like they are heard, no longer feel protected. It is about lost souls who wander our streets, untethered to home or family or reality, chasing a drug which in turn chases them. It is about the damage they inflict on themselves to be sure, Looks like, okay, we, that's the end of the clip there. Um, so th this became sort of a full court press to find a new 
non-traditional local TV audience for Como, and it saw iterations across linear TV, YouTube, Facebook, and Stir, which many of you will know is uh, Sinclair's OTT network. Can you explain a bit more about the project and what your ambitions were for it? Oh, uh, the project originated from an anchor in Como, and he kept covering this story. And every time he uncovered something, all the way down to government funding on how the city was handling the homeless situation, um, it was just all these huge discoveries and this layered story that just if you watch from the beginning to the end of the coverage, or it's actually still going, or to the middle of the coverage, you may have forgotten how we started, right? So the anchor was like, we have enough for a movie here. I mean, we can we can put something together to explain this in a way where we can put it, we have a streaming app now, obviously social media, we have YouTube, we have all these things where time isn't an issue, right? We're not gonna put it in the A block of the show and the A block's not gonna be an hour and a half long, right? So, so we decided, okay, well, he pitched, hey, let's make a documentary. And we had, we had already had a site where we were doing mini docs, things like that called Circa a couple of years before that. Um, and we thought, okay, long form could work in this particular instance. And he went for it. And when I say he went for it, I mean, just the title alone called Seattle is Dying. I mean, that polarized an audience immediately. That created controversy. It created this yearn to watch it, whether you were agreeable to that reference or that statement or whether you disagreed to it. You just wanted to watch it to see what he was going to say. And in the end, it turned into an outstanding piece of journalism. Um, and, I, and I will say, if it got 10 views, I would call it a success. Now, it got tens of millions of views. <laughs> so it's easy to call it a success just based statistically. But just the way it was packaged and the types of audience it grabbed just ran the gamut of demos, right? Um, and so when we look at it on YouTube, it has over 10 million views. And when we look at it on Facebook, which is kind of a different demo, in the millions of views, right? And on our website, in the millions of views. So no matter where we posted this thing, we realized, okay, this is not about the platform. This is about the actual content and the way we packaged it. Did right? you create, were there versions for each of those different social platforms or was, was there one social version? How, how, how many ways did it iterate in? You know what, we did it raw, not raw, but you know, put it together in an hour and some, and we posted it the same way on every platform and it was successful on each platform. Now, we did packages leading up to it. We did TV segments on it. We did social segments on it. We did marketing, we did promos. We did all that stuff too, right? So it wasn't just, we dumped this documentary and it worked, right? We, we promoted it, we marketed it. And in that, in that sense, you know, we kind of did mini stories up to it. So we would post a minute or like that 30 second chunk or whatever that we saw just now, and we'd promote it that way on social. And that would lead to, you know, heavy traffic. But we did, we did put the entire documentary on Facebook and it was a smashing success. In fact, it was even a success on the anchor's Facebook page. He put it, he put the whole thing on his Facebook page and it got a few million views on his own Facebook page. So, so I mean, no matter where we put it, it worked, you know. Mm -hmm. And documentaries sound like a potentially compelling promotional tentpole. Are you finding that they drive audience and visibility in the market to the station itself? Do they attract a new audience back to the station after the documentary? They do. It's a brand play. It's a huge brand play because it it's bold to do, right? So just the simple fact that you're going to have an anchor who is aggressive and is writing, and you saw that writing. It's like, what if I told you Seattle is dying? That was the first line. I think the, the sound wasn't up. But just there, it grabs you and it doesn't sound like a news anchor speaking. It sounds like a narrator, right? But here's a news anchor who's been in the market for decades and who knows the city and loves the city. So he added the context of his own feeling into it. And that's not a normal, you know, tune in at six to watch the news. That's a different way of delivering it. And, and it's, a, it's a huge brand play because it connects the audience with that anchor, first of all. And that anchor works for Como, so it connected the audience with Como. We saw we saw a different kind of audience coming to our platform. Like I said, whether whether they loved it or they hated it, they wanted to watch it. 
Um, but when they saw the outstanding journalism being done and the stories that followed that, because we did stories about reactions, we did the city's reaction to it, we did all those things. So it was this whole like ecosystem that was created around the documentary too afterward. Have you uh, since tried to do this, replicate this in other Sinclair markets? We did. We did it in Columbus. It was called The Core. Uh, statistically, not the bonanza this was, but I will tell you, smashing success. It was, it was such a good piece of storytelling. And it, it's about an hour and 20 minutes long, but it's so good at capturing the opioid epidemic, um, which, will, you know, Ohio is one of the places where it hit the worst and the earliest, right? So, so again, this it's just all this continuing coverage. It's this remarkable storytelling that we thought, okay, there's just so much to consume on it that we packaged it in a way where not only would we reach another audience, but we could tell the entire story in one shot too. Mm -hmm. Joni, sorry to bring you so late into this, but let's start talking about social. Um, your tactics on social media are always evolving at Tegna as they are in most groups. Um, I'd like to ask you specifically first about Facebook and where it has evolved to at this moment in terms of being both a useful and a limiting means of engaging and expanding your audience. Where does it sit on your value chain right now? Where does it sit on my value chain? You know, not the highest, um, but maybe not for the reasons that you think. So I think fortunately we've at Tegna like released ourselves from feeling frustrated if Facebook changes an algorithm. And um, so when I'm thinking about what stresses me out about Facebook, it's not really that I'm worried about referrals declining um, because I'll, Years ago, we decided that's not a smart strategy to have all your eggs in one basket to be dependent on one social platform's algorithm. You know, with Facebook now, the difficulties are like, how can I protect our organization and protect our journalists and protect our audience from a security standpoint, harassment standpoint, misinformation standpoint? So that's like where honestly more of our time and energy when it comes to Facebook is because it is a great brand building opportunity for specifically our talent to have connection with audience, but we want them to be able to not be afraid to open their Facebook, that it's going to take a toll on their mental health or their safety. So when we speak about Facebook, that's really more where we're focusing now than, you know, why am I not getting as much traffic as I got last year? Um, that we're not so worried about because we decided, you know, we don't want to be constantly changing our audience growth strategy like we did, you know, years and years ago, being so dependent on Facebook. We wanted to make sure if they change their strategy, we are diversified in how we connect with our audience. We're focused on our loyalists, that it's going to be OK. We're going to survive. We get audience in other ways. Um, yeah, so that's where Facebook sits with me right now. OK. Um, in the past, YouTube has also been valuable for Tegna, perhaps more so than for other groups, especially when you were building up your Verify investigative brand. Are you still able to grow an audience via YouTube? And where is it now as a tactical tool for Tegna? Yeah, YouTube is higher on the value chain than Facebook for us. Um, you know, I didn't mention in Facebook that it was just really difficult to see the, re the consistent revenue opportunity there, whereas YouTube, it's not so difficult to see. Um, but what we like about YouTube um, is that we do reach a really different audience than we're reaching on Linear and on Facebook, right? So where we get more women on those platforms. We're seeing younger men consuming our YouTube audience. So we don't feel like we're cannibalizing our own properties, um, which is nice. And one thing I really like about YouTube is that it teaches us workflows that set us up for success on other important platforms as well. So, so optimizing video and doing longer form content, what a great way to be set up for streaming success. You know, expanded live streaming, what a great way we're about to launch 24 seven streaming um, as you've seen done by many other Asian groups. Jennifer's is going to launch in a couple weeks. So I think with all the different shiny objects in the social world, like we can learn a lot about how to be consistent in our audience growth, audience growth strategy and how to tweak our workflows in a way that um, it's not like so much whiplash, but we're building upon it. So I, I think that the work that we've done on YouTube has both gotten us new audience without cannibalizing our own, is continuing to grow, is 
a new revenue stream and also is setting us up for a lot of success to lean into what we do best, which is video. Um, and as many people have talked about, our journalists want more opportunities to do long form content, to go live, you know, and that opens up a new platform and sets us up really nicely for our own streaming apps as well. I think you just broke a little news there, Joni, on the 24-7 uh, streams. So we'll have to follow up on that and find out exactly what, when, where, and how on, on uh, Tegna's streaming product. Um, April, Social News Desk has been using a tool called, a uh, relatively new tool called Carousel that originated a while back for advertisers, but now is available for newsrooms. How can this be extrapolated for news and potentially be used as an audience building tool? Yeah, absolutely. So what we've been looking at just as, as um, we were talking about is diversification of platforms. And mostly we've been a lot focused on, you know, Meta and Facebook and those things. But now that we're seeing there's so much priority for these other platforms like Twitter and LinkedIn and things like that. So Twitter came to us and said, hey, we have that we want to roll out this product carousels organically and you have a great user base um, for us to test this and see how you can play with it and use it. So we're like, we jumped on it and built a solution that integrated with Twitter so that you can actually build carousels of content and they can be video carousels, they can be single image carousels. It allows you to group a lot of different content types together from uh, web, if you have a breaking uh, storm coming to your area, you can show different, uh, different photos of what's going on to provide different links of how the uh, storm is coming in. If you are also just have a collection of stories, so like we've been talking about these um, different story collections that you guys have been featuring on your pro programs, you can actually promote all of those together in one tweet and people can scroll through it and see all these different things and engage with it. Um, and it's been really great, the, the reception from it and from we've seen so many different use cases and we have a lot of different ideas of how the news stations are leveraging this. And it's been a great like kind of way to see more innovation in Twitter when it's kind of been kind of static and what's going on in that space. Yeah, yeah. Um, Joni, Tegnet has revamped its approach to UGC, user generated content. That, that's had some audience building benefits, I think you said. Can you explain how you work with UGC now and, and how it relates to the Near Me initiative at the company? Yeah, we tried to accomplish a lot of things as we changed our approach to user generated content. I'm sure, um, Everyone gets a lot of patio furniture when it snows uh, on their Facebook comments and in their uh, Twitter mentions, and that still happens. Um, but we tried to create, and then you have to kind of download it and sift through all this stuff and decide what's valuable for you and make sure you have the rights. So we tried to work on a tool that would uh, solve that in a lot of ways, where we could connect mostly with our loyalists. So the people on our mobile app are really loyal to our brand. Um, they come in, they spend more time and consume more content, um, watch our linear product. So what we did is we, we built a UGC tool where our audience could take photos and videos and directly from their camera roll, they could share it into our app. Um, once it goes into our app, it comes into our own homegrown content management system. Um, so that helps us with rights, right? Because as they're sharing it, they check a little thing that says that we can use it where we need to. Then it helps us with workflow because it comes directly into our content management system. We don't have to go sifting and searching. We still, it's really important that a human is moderating it and verifying it. So that's still very important. We didn't want to automate that. We didn't want to do any... Um, you know, batch approving of user generated content, because that could be really dangerous. Um, so we still have that element. But once it's approved, it's into your CMS to be able to use that video or that photo wherever you want. It is not a quantity play, right? If we needed quantity, we could go on social and we could get endless, endless amounts of user generated content. It's much more of a quality play to enhance our storytelling. These are people in our community with unique photos and videos and more cameras on the streets than we have. So we're looking for gems that can turn into great stories. That's not just like a winter storm photo. Now it helps, right, to get a bunch of photos in an area to paint a picture, but we've also seen some really great photos or videos that lead to follow-up interviews and full packages that go on our newscast and on YouTube. So there's definitely like a storytelling play there. Um, and then the final component of what we call near me, which is part of our UGC tool, is that once that content gets moderated, it's, it's geotagged um, with, you know, where the photo or video came from. So it gets um, plotted on a, a map on our apps called near me, which is to really super serve our hyper local audience 
or to give us coverage in areas that may be harder to get. So when Denver's covering fires two to three hours away from their station, they get a lot of great fire photo and video that can tell a story on a map um, where people can go to and see you know, what's going on in this community, um, which would have taken them a really long time to get out and to send a crew. So there's workflow, there's rights management, there's storytelling ideas. Um, and then once again, just like trying to grow our loyal audience and give them a product that's maybe unique that they can't get in other places, make them feel a part of our news team. Yeah. First, I don't want to knock snow photos because I'm in the deep south and that's how I live vicariously through winter. So let's back off on that a little bit. Okay, sorry. And, and secondly, um, how vis-a-vis -vis audience growth and development, how are you measuring success with this initiative and what kind of success would you say you've had so far with it? So. For me, the biggest success is when we get unique storytelling or when it helps us cover a community that maybe we couldn't. Um, so I, we do track you know, how many submissions we get um, for both photos and videos and how much of that gets approved. And, and those are some great numbers, especially during breaking news and weather. But the true success here is unique storytelling and, ex and expanded coverage in places that we couldn't get and expanded points of view. Mm -hmm. I want to, I have plenty more questions, but I want to take some from the audience right now because we're getting some good ones here. And so they're a bit all over the map to individuals. Um, Melissa Luck asks, uh, Ken, would love to hear more about the newsletter to membership path from WDIV. Uh, DIV, can you explain a little bit more that that funnel journey? Yeah, sure. So we always look at, you know, the levels of um, audience and where they're coming from and where we want them to go. Um, this, you know, this, for instance, people coming from social, are probably near the top of the funnel, which is the biggest um, search also at the top of the funnel. And then when those people are coming in, um, you know, getting them to sign up for newsletters is a huge part of, of moving them through the funnel. So we have a, uh, you know, a big initiative promoting newsletters inside of articles. Um, we have a bunch of new tools that are driving opt-ins um, from people that are visiting our site, um, you know, a certain amount of time. And then the funnel, to membership is still hard to measure, quite frankly, but we see it because the the better relationships that we build with, with people through those newsletters, the more likely they are to funnel into our membership program. And we already know that a ton of people that sign up for our newsletters are also our insiders. And we actually have some research that shows that um, the, most people that find out about the insider program are email subscribers. Um, rather than TV watchers or people that are using our website. So well, that's, a, that's a huge thing for us. Related to that, we also have a question about promotion. Are you promoting them on broadcast and uh, digital platforms and any group targeting promotion? Yeah, we have promos running pretty regularly. Um, our talent are constantly pushing to the newsletters. Our franchises usually tag out with, you know, sign up for the newsletter or something like that. And then we are constantly promoting inside of articles, like I said. And then the social news desk uh, Facebook uh, campaign was really, really helpful for us to, to find some new audience um, instead of trying to convince our existing audiences uh, to sign up. And, and, and those in the audience sending questions, please put them in the Q&A. You're fragmenting my attention span. Um, Ken, do you have an agreed uh, upon amount of time that the news team works on newsletters every day? No. Uh, it really just depends on the frequency of the newsletter, who's, work, or who's writing the newsletter, um, setting those expectations and making sure they're at the, they're a priority. And again, that just goes back to having that full newsroom buy-in on the priority of newsletters. And once, once you get that, um, after, after a certain amount of time, people kind of get it. Uh, Jennifer, a couple of questions for you. How do you go about sourcing the interviewers for the interview series? And that's such a, an important part of it, right? And and Andy would would say he talked to a lot of people, and and it goes through a process to find I think the right person that that participates in this. Um, I told you Joy came to us uh, really from one of our reporters who had talked to her and knew her, and so that that's how we found Joy. And then uh, Andy followed up from a school board meeting and 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 spoke with this couple who spoke up at the school board meeting. And I think for this last one, the, the fact that we have two that we can show, um, I, I see the question, uh, you know, was it hard to earn their trust? 
Yeah, I mean, that's part of the process is, is you have to be very transparent about what the process is going to look like and feel like. But now that we have a couple that we've done, we can show someone, look, this is how we do it. This is how it, it plays out. And we're really clear about the fact is we want you to go through the process and we'll be interested where your what your conclusion is, whatever it is, right? We're not, we don't have, uh, we're not trying to drive you one way or the other. We just want you to go through it. And then we're curious to see where do you end up? And I think that I think that the fact that we did these first two led us to be able to do the election one. I think the election one would have been very difficult to do if I don't if we didn't have uh, proven you know storytelling that shows how transparent we really are. You don't want to start with elections as your topic there. Probably not. Yeah, that would have been a tough one. I think to pull off. <laughs> I'm curious about the time commitment for these citizen journalists. It seems like it's a heavy lift for them. They've got to be involved. What what generally is the scope of their of their participation time wise? Well, it's it is a pretty heavy lift, and I, I think that's the other piece of it that it's it's for, we we generally do four three to four experts, um, and so the interviews are you know twenty minutes, half hour. I think one even went longer than that. So um, it's it it is the um, and they're not Zoom. They're in person. So you do have to get some people who are willing to make that commitment that they can go to these interviews and and you know be there for that allotted period of time. But but and, and then I think you know to find that person who's really willing to do it, who really is willing, who's really open to say, okay, I want to know, I want to ask these questions. And I think that we we've found people who are tr who have a very strong position, by the way, especially our critical race and even our election um, um, citizen they have strong feelings or strong opinions and they were also willing, but they also had a lot of questions and they wanted to, they wanted to ask their own questions. So you have to have that piece of it. You can't have somebody who's so closed off. They don't want to hear anything else, but they right. did want to have, they wanted to ask. And in fact, in the critical race theory, the woman said, you know, it, it's, it's, I, I realized I was taking so much from social media and what friends were telling me. And it, and it was not accurate, right? I wasn't getting the, a full picture. And so it was important that I went through this process and that you really dig into something like this. In, in terms of replicating this, you, you have, you say you're about to do your third one. Obviously they're very labor intensive, but can, are you going to be able to amp up the frequency of pieces like this on more issues? Yeah, I think so. I think that there's been a learning process, right? The first one, uh, especially, we learned so much from the first one. And, you know, that that is the, one of the bigger questions. How many can we do? How can you scale it? How can we take the same idea and spread it through more storytelling? You know, so it's, it's those are all the, the issues that and the questions we have and that we're working on. But the, the, the Andy, who's, who's the key person behind it, is, is learning how to turn these around. You know, he's turned this last one around, frankly, more quickly than I thought he would. So mm -hmm. he's he's figuring it out and and getting a system down that I think is getting uh, allowing us to to turn these a lot more quickly. We were we already have a couple of ideas what our next project and topics. There's no shortage of topics, right? Okay. So we we had it's fun to talk about the topics and what would we think will be next. Yeah, and of course you get better every time you do it. And yeah. Uh, Manny, quick question for you: Were you able to generate revenue from the Facebook posting of Seattle is dying at all? Probably not. Yeah, yeah, we were, especially, you know, when things are longer than three minutes on Facebook, they generate considerable revenue when the views go into the millions. Mm -hmm. So this was like an hour or some long, and it was in the tens of millions of views. So you can imagine it created, it, it made us a pretty penny on that revenue side, it made us some revenue on YouTube, made us a lot on our own websites too, you know, we really we try to diversify that number, not just worry about Facebook revenue. Like Joni was saying earlier, we don't want to put all our eggs in that basket. Especially mm -hmm. Facebook has a lot of control over how much that basket is. So they take eggs and move them around. It's not only your egg, you're sharing your egg with Facebook. Well, that, that tees up my next question, which is generally speaking, are any of you among the broadcasters able to throttle back a bit from your efforts on social at this point to concentrate your efforts instead on audience building work on your own platforms? Or is basically social in toto uh, as important as it ever was for you? And anybody can jump in on that. Well, I'll start with that one. Facebook, I think we misused at first. I will say that about broadcasters. We went all in. We were giving away the farm, as we like to say here in this company. And we were so aggressive with it that we didn't care because it was one-to-one, -one, right? If you had 10,000 Facebook likes, all 10,000 people saw that post. 
right? Mm -hmm. So as Facebook changed its business strategy and, and, you know, broadcast TV is not the biggest part of Facebook strategy. So they really don't prioritize us. Uh, we had to start prioritizing ourselves, right? So the moment we started looking at it, okay, this is a tool, not the whole thing, right? That's when we kind of throttled it back. And like we've talked about earlier in this call, and we always talk about at work is, you know, diversity is put, you know, use every audience and use every tool for the strength it has. Don't, don't put it all in one place and don't go all in on, especially a third party, you know, you got to focus on your own thing for good. I, you know, I, I told you this on the phone the other day, you know, Google to us, YouTube, Google is just as important as anything else, but it's still a tool. It's not our platform, right? Our platform comes first. In fact, you were saying that SEO has become increasingly important. You know, it started super important and then social kind of dragged it out. Mm -hmm. And now we're back there again, right? Everything so, old is new again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I was going to say that we we really emphasize search, and I think that helped as opposed to de-emphasizing social or what. But we really put a pretty decent strategy in for search, and I think that helped us diversify. I totally agree with everything Manny said about diversifying. Do we have general agreement on this point? I would say the one thing I'd add to this is like, this is what really our dynamic news ads product does is it takes Facebook and it takes social and it takes them to your owned and own O and O property. So it drives your newsletter signups, your app downloads, all those things. Because if you're going to spend money to get audience engaged, you want to with your audience, not to buy likes on Facebook or just to get engagement on it. So we want to make sure you at the end of the day have control that relationship and that conversation. Right, right, absolutely. Um, for, for each of the broadcasters here, how much has audience building on your streaming platforms become a priority for you? And what are you doing specifically to, to draw viewers there? And I know everybody Tegna is about to have a new announcement, it seems, uh, imminently, but, but, but you do have streaming right now anyway. You're on, represented on different platforms. And of course, you've got Stir and WDIV has been on streaming for pretty much as long as streaming has been streaming. So um, what are you doing specifically for that platform? Manny, you want to take that first because of Stir? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, specifically, we keep growing the business. You know, um, we we own Tennis Channel. We own a bunch of local newsrooms. Uh, we have a lot of video and a lot of content, right? So the streaming platform is a natural place for a lot of this stuff to go. Um, we mentioned documentaries already. Those could be hour, half hour chunks on a streaming platform. Um, but it always gets down to diversity of content, not just one thing, right? How do we promote it? We promote it on our air. We promote it on our social media. And I guess the best way to promote it, the way I've seen it promoted, the most successful way is when you buy a television or, you know, and you get... Uh, when you get uh, a tablet, it's in the app store and it's in and it's in the television, you know, app downloads. And you know, for you know, if you bought a Roku TV, it's easier to find. But you know, the more we put it in people's heads and the more they search it when they buy a new or or just go to their smart TV and try to download something new. I, that's one of the best ways I've seen it promoted is when it pops up in an ad on your TV while you're looking for Netflix, Prime Video, mm -hmm. name the streaming platform, right? Um, and then we offer that thing where you can watch our local news, right? Which not a lot of other streaming platforms offer. Mm -hmm. Ken, has, has it been a priority to, to concentrate again on WDIV's streaming presence? Yeah, just over the last couple of years, especially, and then this year, it's a huge priority for us. We just launched a uh, 10 p.m. Um, streaming only newscast, um, and uh, we've been doing our four o'clock newscast because of the Olympics uh, also on the app. So we have been, th during the Olympics, we've been really, really pushing uh, Local 4 Plus. Um, and then, you know, we've had some, we've had some plans pre-COVID to, to really dive into exclusive programming um for that which which will pick up again probably this year but yeah for sure it's a, it's a it's one of the key priorities for us in 2022. this is a question for anyone um unless anybody else wants to jump in on streaming tag may want to wait on that or, i can say one thing michael that i think we've done a lot of work 
to set ourselves up for success. And then there's a lot of stuff we have to undo that we're used to doing to be successful on our streaming platform. So like the work that Jennifer and Manny have talked about, these like long form, great pieces, what a great place for that to live. Um, we also all cut a bunch of short clips for our website. What a horrible place for that to live, you know? So we have to be really smart about understanding when we we're putting a lot of energy into streaming, but we need to really understand like what is the audience experience when they're trying to find us on Roku or Fire TV or Apple TV or wherever um, that if we treat it like we treated our websites at the very beginning of our websites where we just dumped off on our broadcast content and now we're just going to try to take our website content and put it on streaming. We're not really going to have people sticking with us for a very long time, you mm -hmm. know. So where, why are they coming to watch us? They do like to watch our local news. They might like to watch that time shifted. They, you know, we have great long form content. And so um, I think like whenever we're launching a new tool, I think a lot about like our workflow as well and things that we need to do to set up the best product. So um, like I mentioned before, like we've been building a twenty four seven tool directly into our CMS so that we can give total programming control um, to our stations to really be smart about how they program their feed and also to be really flexible as news breaks and things change. But you can't, so, so don't just catch and sink it on the VOD menu though. You can't just throw everything in there and, and just to stuff it up. I don't think that that works. Yeah, yeah. Um, for anybody here, do, do your companies or stations set goals each year for expanding audience on linear streaming and other digital platforms? And if so, what kind of gains are you looking for or in terms of uh, percentage terms or, or are you simply just looking to avoid declines? Okay, we set goals because goals shape behavior, you yes. know? So we reevaluate our, our KPIs and we say, you know, is this, are we measuring the things that are important to us? And, you know, if we're going to make a change to a KPI, we need to be really thoughtful about it um, because we know it's going to shape behavior on what we do. Um, I think that if we're just looking for are we up or are we down, that's not sophisticated enough. Um, because if an algorithm changes or if audience is shifting to more streaming, then you could be up without doing a lot of work, right? So you have to look, you know, something about the beauty of a group like Sinclair or Tegna is that you have a lot of stations where you can look at similar markets and similar sizes. And you can say like, how are you trending as compared to other people in a similar situation? Because if everybody's growing, you know, 20%, I'm just making this up. Um, if you're growing 5%, that's not, a success, right? But if you're growing 70%, that's a huge success. Mm -hmm. What about? Oh, I was just going to say, I, I agree. You know, we definitely set goals so that we're moving forward. Um, but we are constantly changing those goals around depending on, you know, what, what we're learning. Because a lot of the stuff that we're setting goals on are, are in new territory. Um, and then, you know, for instance, our insider program we could grow it 20,000, 30,000, you know, if we, if we really wanted to, we could probably blow it up with, with signups on, with contests or, you know, anything like that to just kind of get that volume up. But the key, the key points that we're looking at are how many people are coming back, how many people are logged into our website, how many people are engaging with us. Those are the key things that we're looking at on a daily basis and that we value a lot more than the, the big volume KPIs. Yeah, yeah. and that's where, I, that's where I was gonna go at the end for that question. Growth is great. The year of the pandemic, we saw, you know, March 2020, we saw numbers spike through things we had never seen before. Records broken, right? And then 2021 comes and then we have to do year over year and we're like, oh my goodness, are we failing? No, we're not failing. It's just a different time and a different, you know, era. And an unprecedented era uh, isn't sustainable growth, right? So we look at sustainability. So... Um, just like Ken said, it's the value of the growth. It's not just the raw number. Because I guarantee you, if you just did recall stories, stimulus check stories, you would grow through the roof, period. You could just make a website on recalls and stimulus. Are you going to get your stimulus check? Those, mm -hmm. those stories go bonkers, but they end up being absolutely nothing sustainable to who we are as a brand. And who's going to be there tomorrow clicking on, 
you know, an actual important story in your community. And for all of you, again, anyone can jump in on this. And Tim, I'd like to hear from you perhaps first. Um, what about what are the ideal tools now for measuring audience on linear and digital? What is it Nielsen, Comscore, Google Analytics? What are, what are your, you know, what are, what are the metrics that you find most useful to have at hand? Well, I think it was such a good question to ask about the goals and what you're setting. And, and Joni's answer kind of talking about, well, yes, because we need to set our own KPIs and the only things that the things that matter to us, right? Uh, we all like to believe that our metrics are completely accurate, whether it's Nielsen or Comscore or iSpot or any of these other ones that, that come along. And we've had a lot of consternation in our industry talking about, well, we're moving from, you know, these transactional sales based off ratings to impressions and eyeballs. And that's a big changeover. But ideally, as data helps us get there, we can finally get to a point where we're not estimating who's watching our, our products. And there are so many different ones out there, you know, but if I can tell you that a viewer on digital, I know a lot more about that person traditionally than I do on television, as ATSC 3.0 comes into full effect and as we have new measurement standards in companies, we'll do a much better job of being able to measure our whole audience and really be able to tell who's watching our products. And then of course, sell, that, uh, sell our products in a way that is better for advertisers. Um, but I think the key point through all that is whatever we set up as our most important measurement system, has to be based on who we are as a brand. What are we trying to accomplish in our communities? If I'm a local station and I want long-term sustainable growth, I want good measurement, but I need that measurement to be set up for what is my community talking about? What is my community interested in? And I think the biggest challenge I see in some of the newsrooms that, that I work with is, you know, they'll have high quality newscasts that completely miss the conversations that are going on in their communities. And the successful stations are finding ways to measure these things, both in their community, and we're all looking to find better ways to measure our entire audience um, through, I think, what is a very experimental time. You know, the 50 years of just relying on Nielsen, that's gone. And we're all kind of finding our way and figuring out what does it mean if I'm using Comscore instead? What if I'm, what does it mean if I have Comscore and Nielsen? And if I'm NBC and trending towards iSpot, where are we gonna go? What's that going to mean for our sales teams this is a really important question to, to figure out and see where we go right now. And a good note, I think, on which to end because we have come over our time. So um, I'm sorry to say we've got to bring it to a close. Um, thank you to April, Tim, Manny, Joni, Ken, and Jennifer. Thank you all for watching and being here today. Uh, and thanks for, for for, for everything. Um, we've got plenty more TV News Check Working Lunch webinars coming along, including later this month. So check tvnewscheck.com for the latest details. Thanks once more to you all for being here. Great ideas, really a lot to think about and chew over and hope to see you all again soon. Cheers. <laughs>